They're very difficult to see. And so the twist that we use is actually to listen in on the conversations that they're having with each other as a means of collecting data about where they are, how many there are, and what kinds of behaviors they're involved in. You're convinced Bigfoot exists? Yes. I've heard him speak. But, um... Listen for yourself. I'm just gonna let it roll. <laughs> Using these computer-generated spectrograms, they can see the low-frequency sounds. And then we can actually look at the calls. And what does this visualization tell us? It tells us that there's incredible complexity. It all started uh, six years ago, next month in May. Right down at the base of the mountain I'm on now is a reservoir next to which a young man saw a Sasquatch running through the woods in 2006, May 26th, and got in contact with me. And since then I've been researching here in this area, which is about 11 miles from my home, and recorded uh, six hours worth of wood knocks. And also I uh, had that tree pushed down next to me and my daughter and I came upon what seemed to be tracks also very near here. See honey this might be where the where the heel went and that and that's the that's the mid tarsal hinge I think you see it goes up and down because their their feet bend like this. A really wide impression. This is the uh, mountain that's right up above that reservoir. This part up here is even less frequented by human beings. There are no trails up here. I call this the fortress. It's um, almost fully ringed by huge granite uh, walls and boulders. But there's a way to get up there um, with difficulty over there. And I've got my long-term audio kit that I'm going to install up there. Here's some, some nice trail markers. You know, if it were just one, it wouldn't mean much, but here are two broken right on the opposite sides of each other here. These are old. Uh, up here we have one that's about 10, 11 feet off the ground. Also broken and apparently twisted. So, I mean, I think that they... Oh, there's more up there. Just found a classic kind. And this is much more recent. Because this is a green sapling and this is the the beautiful dual snap I think they use this area okay this vernal pond looks like as good a place as any You can use any 12 volt battery and then get yourself some of these clips which lead to a cigarette lighter adapter. Then you put in um, one of these um, USB power adapters and then that goes in there and then the other side just um, powers the uh, Tascam DR08. This is especially handy. It's about a hundred dollars and you can program it to tape every day at a certain time. So say 9 p.m. till 5 a.m. This one will give you about three weeks, believe it or not. Put a sweatshirt down on top here. A little bit of extra warmth and to muffle the uh, sound of the electronics because they have extremely acute hearing. And about something like this to keep the rain out. So I put dirt over it. This may be too conspicuous and 
it might ruin the mics when it rains. But if I were to put them underneath, it would sort of defeat the purpose. Okay, it's exactly a week later. I'm up here and something has dug up everything that I so carefully arranged. And we'll see what's left under here. Oh. Oh boy. It's been really banged up. It was it was um, without any of these scuffs um, beforehand. And now it's really all it's been beaten around. Sure didn't work. The um, fortress of solitude up there is on that side now. I've come to the other side of it in between two summits. I'm now in the dip in between them. And I'm using a bigger battery this time. 30 pounds. I lugged it up the mountain. The hole is a little bit deeper. A bunch more dirt than last time. Then leaves. And finally, this big birch branch that I found on the ground nearby. Now if this doesn't work, I just really don't know how to do it. It's a nice twist here. See how it was, it was bent around that way. So it's at least two or three inches longer than mine. Can't see any obvious toe impressions, but it's wider than mine too. By a good deal. This is pretty, pretty darling. You have this tiny baby sapling. That side goes under, goes under here. And then this side goes under here. Every now and then you have to return to the site and switch out the memory card, then listen through hundreds of hours of the nighttime audio files with nothing significant happening, nothing but familiar animals and wind and rain. Finally though, some good stuff comes up. My daughter and I see if we can duplicate the sound. <laughs> there you go. But wood knocks are far less valuable than vocals, so you keep on hoping. Keep on listening. And keep a sharp eye out for other sorts of signs. This is new. I do not remember this whatsoever. That's good news. Good news. Typical pin sapling right here. This is, this is the trail I walk in. There's no two ways about it. I mean, this just seems a clear signal, whether to me or to the others, I don't know. It's exactly at waist level across the only path I've been using. One night in late July, something very strange. Mm -hmm. 
something other than the obvious frogs. Hours of this unrecognizable sound over and over. I have no idea what to make of it and wouldn't necessarily associate it with Sasquatch except there are occasional percussions. And it does remind me of the snarl I recorded in East Texas one night at the same site where I shot my thermal footage three years earlier. Still, though, it just doesn't make enough sense to include in this video so months go by until I start thinking in terms of infrasound. Could it be that this sound is a vocalization, but just the portion that's audible to our ears? Our ears, of course, can process a much narrower range than many other animals can. In researching this topic, I come across a study that has been ongoing for almost 20 years now that strikes me as profoundly relevant to our own research. Cornell University's Elephant Listening Project. Well, the Elephant Listening Project is trying to understand the family structure and the ecology of forest elephants. They're very difficult to see, and so the twist that we use is actually to listen in on the conversations that they're having with each other as a means of collecting data about where they are, how many there are, and what kinds of behaviors they're involved in. Well, the way that we do those kinds of studies is to put sound recorders up in the forest or around resources that the elephants are coming into and record over many, many months. Then we bring all of those data back here to the lab and uh, analyze them. What we've learned about the elephants is uh, so far primarily where they are, when, when they're there, and how many there are. For two decades, a group of wild African elephants has been watched over, studied, and protected by their own guardian angel an extraordinary American scientist named Andrea Turcalo. Elephants communicate in a complicated, sophisticated language that scientists are trying to decipher and compile into the world's first elephant dictionary. Commuting to her job is a hike. The last couple of miles took us through some interesting terrain. So who made this trail, Andrea? This was made by hundreds of years of elephant traffic in this forest. Andrea has hiked this trail twice a day for nearly 20 years. Where does it go? We could hear something before we could see anything. Suddenly, the trail ended, and right before us was an opening called the Dzanga Clearing, and more than 50 forest elephants. It's been now 19 years that I've been observing this particular population of elephants. Very long time. Yeah, it is a long time, but it takes a long time to know elephants. I find this elephant dictionary exceedingly fascinating. I mean, how large a dictionary will it be? We don't know. We have to really know a lot more about the behavior of these animals to sort of sort out these different vocalizations and what they mean. Andrea's expertise brought her to the attention of Cornell University. Peter Regg, a behavioral biologist from Cornell, says the dictionary is still in its early stages. We're in kindergarten. We're just learning the very first few words. And Andrea is going to help us put those words together. It's a very, very complex process because we can't ask the elephant, what did you just say? But they can match elephant sounds with behavior they can see and classify those sounds into distinct categories. Can you tell me what some of them are? Well, there's these low-frequency rumbles. It sounds like a big cat purring. Those are, the, those are the vocalizations that help keep groups in contact with each other. As you can imagine, my head just about exploded when I heard that purr, as she refers to it. So either we've got elephants up on that mountain that hold sticks and make percussion noises, or what? It's a bear or a mountain lion making low sounds like that, and that still leaves us the percussion problem. There are protest calls. In newborns, you have a particularly high cry, and when you hear it, you know it's a very, very young calf. And some of these big bulls, um, when they go into must, which is this sexual state, they make a special rumble, which is very low and very pulsating.
But it turns out that these vocalizations are just a small fraction of the sounds elephants make. Until a few years ago, scientists had no idea that most of what elephants are saying can't be heard by the human ear. The base of their vocalization is infrasonic. In other words, the, the frequency on which their call is built is below what we can hear. The elephants use those low sounds to find one another in the dense forests where they spend most of their time. Elephants are using very low frequencies which travel far, at least two or three kilometers. 6,000 miles away, in upstate New York, at a lab at Cornell University, researchers are listening to everything from the sound of hummingbirds to the sound of whales. <laughs> Figuring out which elephant is talking, where it's located, and what it's saying has been a big challenge. Researchers initially strung nine acoustic recording devices around the clearing. As the sound reached each recorder at a different time, they could pinpoint the location of the speaking elephant. Picking up sounds too low to hear was another challenge, but recording the sounds normally and playing them back faster was a revelation. For example, the clearing at night sounds like this. Played back three times faster, this is what the clearing sounds like. You can hear the elephants rumbling calls. But to figure out what the calls mean, the Cornell team spends more time looking than listening. Using these computer-generated spectrograms, they can see the low-frequency sounds. And then we can actually look at the calls. And what does this visualization tell us? It tells us that there is incredible complexity. So if, as in the case of, of these elephants that they've been studying, uh, the majority of Sasquatch communication, too, uh, perhaps takes place below the level that we can hear. The question is then, uh, what percentage of it can we capture um, just by speeding up or slowing down of the playback? Um, or do we need special equipment that can afford us a much broader range of their acoustics? I gotta look into that. If anybody out there knows, please get in contact with me. I think this may be the most promising, the softest and least invasive approach to studying uh, Sasquatch. Um, there still is the ethical question, is eavesdropping um, really okay? And I think in the next few months and years people will array themselves on various sides of, of these moral questions uh, about how we can permit ourselves to make inroads into their world. But there are also severe uh, impediments to even studying them once we decide uh, what methods may be acceptable to our moral compass. Um, you know, unlike these elephants that we just saw, there's no central place that we know that we can set up our um, listening posts. Um, they move all around. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's a shot in the dark where we put uh, our equipment, even if we can hide it from them and make them not feel invaded. You know, I just had one uh, kit out there on the mountain uh, in the middle of territory that may be 50 square miles that they make use of in any given period of time. So it's just a ridiculously steep hill that I'm trying to climb, you know, methodologically to gather an, any usable information. The home habituation sites will give us uh, a sense of, of their nature, their intelligence, their playfulness, what they're capable of intellectually and emotionally, but that will not tell us what they're like when they're just among themselves, within their own culture. Because when they're visiting us, they're after all in visiting mode. Probably they only uh, expose a limited number of facets of what composes their whole being. There is a, a researcher named Scott Nelson who is at the frontier of collecting and analyzing Sasquatch language. What Scott Nelson hears in his headphones is strange, disturbing, and unexplainable all at once. You are convinced Bigfoot exists? Yes. I've heard him speak. And it, you will hear him speak here in a moment. Before you pass judgment on Nelson, let me tell you a little of his past. He retired from the Navy after a 17-year career as a cryptolinguist, intercepting Russian communications and decoding them. 
Currently, Nelson is a professor at Wentworth College in Missouri. Because of what I did in the Navy, you know, spending years and several thousand hours speeding the human voice up and slowing it down, and I could just, I detected language in, in those vocalizations. Those vocalizations were captured on audio tape in the Sierra Nevada mountains by a group of hunters in the early 70s. Right here is a juvenile. Nelson came across them a few years ago while helping his son write a paper on Bigfoot. Actually, Stevie, there's language here. He said, Dad, how, how can that be? It sounds like a bunch of apes fighting to me. And I said, well, we, we have to slow it down like Dad used to do in the Navy. All right. But um, listen for yourself. I'm just going to let it roll. The people who I know of who are currently pushing the boundaries on learning about Sasquatch vocalizations are Scott Nelson, whom you just saw. If you want to... Um, go into more depth uh, about him, there are two interviews on YouTube entitled Sasquatch Language 1 and Sasquatch Language 2. Another one is Bob Truskowski, who uh, studies a site in eastern Texas. You can find him at sasquatchsounds.com. Another one is a man who goes by the name Monongahela, and he's at Sasquatch Bioacoustic. Dot blogspot dot com. And the other one I would point you toward is Alex Midnight Walker, and he's on YouTube channel BF Research SE Southeast. We are going to be shifting to a more anthropological posture toward Sasquatch than a primatological posture with the Jane Goodall and the Diane Fossey, because this species is, of course, much more akin to us. And Yet, the classic anthropology models were presupposing the fact that we know where a given tribe or group or society is, so that we can then embed in it, go on location. Well, with Sasquatch, there is no on location. So these are fascinating issues that are going to be unfolding over the next few years, um, and I'm glad that, that we're around to help negotiate them together.